Throughout history, many interactions between those of Judaism and Christianity have sparked much debate between the two religions. Both beliefs are intricate and complex, and while they might use the same words and terminology, different meanings and perspectives are derived from identical terms. One of the most significant examples of conflicting interpretations is in the idea and function of Satan. In Christianity, with the Old and New Testaments taken into account, Satan is a fallen angel and enemy of God who leads the world into sin and temptation and does not cease from pursuing the damnation of everyone and anyone. For those of Judaism, however, the belief of Satan is something considerably different. In this segment, we will be addressing the Jewish interpretation of the devil not being an enemy of God, but rather his servant. We will be looking at some of their most influential sources and responding accordingly from a Christian perspective, with commentary and scriptural references. Now let's begin. Satan by Joseph Jacobs and Ludwig Blau on Jewish Encyclopedia. Yet it is also evident from the prologue that Satan has no power of independent action, but requires the permission of God, which he may not transgress. He cannot be regarded, therefore, as an opponent of the deity. And the doctrine of monotheism is disturbed by his existence no more than by the presence of other beings before the face of God. Let's get biblical. Is Satan a servant of God or is he God's arch enemy? Pages 348 to 354 by Tovia Singer. According to Jewish teachings, Satan is an agent of God and has no independent agency or autonomy. God created Satan in his wisdom and for his purpose to test man's faith. In the instances where Satan is discussed in Jewish scriptures, Satan is consistently described as a loyal servant of God rather than a disobedient angel. Throughout the corpus of the Jewish scriptures, there is not a single instance in which any angel, Satan included, opposes the sovereign will of God. Like within Christianity, I think the prevailing view, in the garden, the serpent is synonymous with Satan. Does that idea exist within Judaism? We could say that's Satan, fine. But... In the Christianity, Satan is an independent agent, originally a great angel that eventually went into rebellion against God. That's Lucifer. There's nothing like that in Tanakh. And in Judaism, Satan was created by God in order to seduce us, to cast forth blandishments. In turn, we need to resist them. And God says in Deuteronomy 30, you can do it. You can make it. What Christianity has wrong about Satan and demons is their belief that Satan is a enemy of God. It's a malevolent angel, a metaphysical being that's at war with God. So Satan and demons, it's the metaphysical world. HaKadosh Baruch Hu created them. And he created them in order to give us free will. In the book of Job, we encounter Satan who comes to God and before the ministering angels and points out that this fellow named Job, and granted he's very righteous, but if he were tested, he perhaps would not be righteous. And God instructs Satan, okay, this is what you can do to him, to test him, and this is what you can't do. You can't take away his life. And Satan, 
um, does exactly what God tells him to, hardly an enemy of God. In Christianity, Satan is part of a dualistic view in that there's God, the good God, and it's kind of an idea that you would find in Zoroastrianism, this dualism where you have a an, an evil, malevolent, metaphysical entity that's at war with God. When it comes to Satan, bear in mind that man is created in the image of God. And therefore, our default is to serve Hashem and never to sin. And if there was no Satan in the world, we would have no free will because we would never want to sin. It would be silly. So no angel can go into rebellion against God. That can't happen. They have no free will. They only do what Hashem created them for. Satan is there to give us free will, and he's mentioned very infrequently in Tanakh, and therefore it's very easy to identify exactly what his purpose is in the world, and therefore the fact that Satan demons are used, that's not relevant to anything. Paul uses that, that he refers to the devil as the lord of this world, and that's a... Um, an idea that's thoroughly unbiblical. Uh, du- it's highly dualistic. It has nothing to do with Judaism. It has everything to do with Gnosticism. Here, you can see how Satan is viewed as serving God by testing men to see whether or not they are truly loyal to him. This, however, doesn't really make sense if you think about it for longer than five minutes as we will now clearly demonstrate within these next five points. First off, Satan didn't give any free will when it came to eating of the forbidden fruit, as it was God's command to not eat of it, although he placed it there to give man free will as documented in Genesis 2 verses 16 to 17. The devil in no wise made the tree, so Satan cannot take any credit for the ability of choice given to Adam, Eve, and mankind. If Satan was indeed serving God as he led Adam and Eve into eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, then why did Satan get cursed after? Let's read that passage just as a recap. Genesis 3 verses 14 to 15 And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. If God and Satan were actually buddies, God should have been like, Wow, great work, you're up for promotion. Rather than condemning him to eat dust all the days of his life, to transport himself across the world with only his belly, and to eventually bruise his head. If we look to Ezekiel 28 verses 13 to 17, there is no way that this is referring to King Tyrus, but God is using Tyrus to expose the workings of Satan. Similarly to how Jesus addresses Peter as Satan in Matthew chapter 16. The passage starts off by saying in verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Tell me, when was Tyrus in Eden, the garden of God? Answer, never. Now, Other than Adam, Eve, and God, who else was in the Garden of Eden? That's right, the serpent! We can even see that this figure is no man at all, but is rather a cherub, 
as found within verses 14 and 16. Now let's read the last verse of this passage. Ezekiel 28 verse 17 Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Hmm. That verse sounds familiar. I wonder where else a passage like that could have been. Isaiah 14 verses 12 to 15 How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Seems like more than a coincidence that in both of these passages the figure in question is to be cast down to hell after what he had done to the nations and kings of the earth. I think it's not only fair to say that this is the same being, but that it doesn't sound as though God and this cherub get along too well and you would almost think they're not the best of friends. The idea that angels don't have free will, and therefore Satan doesn't have free will either, is a complete contradiction to what is not only written in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament as well. We can see this even in the dialogue between Satan and God in Job chapter 1. God points to Job and delights in how good of a man he is, where Satan basically tells God the only reason why Job is so virtuous is because he's incredibly blessed, and that if his possessions were all taken away, he would curse God. The Lord allows Satan to prove his point by taking away everything from Job and does almost everything he can do to him just shy of killing the man. If Satan didn't have free will, God would have just said, Satan, go ruin Job's life. But God was not eager to simply punish a righteous man and it was Satan who suggested this idea as a challenge to God and Job, implying Satan has a mind of his own. A chapter that we can see angels explicitly disobeying God's will is right before the flood in Genesis chapter 6. Let's read the passage and then discuss how we can know that these beings are in fact fallen angels. Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 to 4 And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. We know that the sons of God are angels because of verses like Job chapter 1 verse 6, where angels are not called angels but rather, you guessed it, the sons of God. This caused serious ramifications for mankind, 
as giants filled the earth as a result of the offspring of these angels and the daughters of man. We know that this offspring was not pleasing to God. As Genesis 6 verse 12 says, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. As a result of these sons of God having children with the daughters of men, God flooded the whole world. Which doesn't sound as though God was too thrilled by all of this. There are other examples of angels having their own free will, as found in the example of 1 Kings 22 verses 19 to 22, where the Lord asks his angels, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead, where an angel goes before him and says, I will persuade him, and I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. God permits the angel to do this. However, if the angel did not have a say in the matter and was responsive to God involuntarily, then God would have just said, do this, and it would have been done. The devil wishes to see the failure of man based on his own pride and arrogance, where God does not delight in the suffering of man, as found in passages like Ezekiel 18 verse 23, where it reads, have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord, and not that he should return from his ways and live? Or verses like Lamentations 3 verse 33, where it reads, For he doth not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men. God will deliver those who oppose him into the hands of Satan, permitting him only to do so much as entails. Sometimes so those who were rebellious against the Lord will come to repentance. This can be seen in the New Testament through Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 5, where Paul instructs the church to cast out fornicators from amongst the assembly using such particular wording as to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. It says in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, in whom the God of this world, lowercase g, not uppercase, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. This verse is in reference to Psalm 82, where verse 1 says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty, he judgeth among the gods. And verses 6 to 7 says, I have said, Ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Someone can be called a lowercase g god, as this title can be in reference to rulers, leaders, and kings. This word can even be used for those who are perceived to be of a disproportionate status in relation to God and man. One such example is in Exodus 7 verse 1, where it reads, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. The idea that the New Testament teaches that the devil is some sort of alternative deity next to Jehovah is not a factual statement, and the Christian perspective of Satan is not derived from Zoroastrianism, but is derived from the teachings of the Tanakh. The New Testament says, 
For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. In the end, if you believe that the devil is serving God, Satan is blinding you from the truth, and is not trying to help you or God. Your adversary is trying to keep you in the dark in his subtlety. If Jewish tradition and interpretation is indeed wrong here concerning the intentions of Satan, what else could these traditions be teaching that is contrary to the word of God? Consider what the New Testament says and verify whether these things are so, according to the Torah and the Tanakh. You might just find that it has more insight into Jewish scriptures than Judaism would have you believe.